Welcome in the new podcast episode. This time I'm talking to Maria Garcia Alvarez. Welcome, Maria. Welcome. Thank you. And you, um, we have been talking now for almost 45 minutes already. 45 minutes, <laughs> yeah. We do the podcast. The pre-podcast. The pre-podcast. <laughs> and, um, but you are working at the Windersheim Hogeschool. Yeah. And you... I want to talk to so many things about this whole part because you are incorporating the IDGs into the in into your um students maybe that's the right word into your studies tell me a bit more how you are you doing this how did this start and and how how will this develop what do you think well we incorporate them in the curriculum and of course uh, our program is global project and change management it's part of the Vincent Honors College and our philosophy um it is to teach for sustainability. So we do education for sustainable development. And that means that uh, beyond the discipline, in this case, project manager and change uh, management, we want our students to make a better world, to change the world using these tools. And we were also working in the curriculum with other type of competences, uh, the framework of education for sustainable development from UNESCO, but these are really academic frameworks, sometimes difficult for everyone to understand. And as you know, in uh, in academia, what we cannot assess, we don't use. <laughs> uh, so we were redoing and uh, reframing a little bit the, the curriculum because we want to move more holistic away from subjects, eh? work like more in units that create more meaningful uh, learning experiences for the students. And then what we did is, um, okay, let's take a look at the narrative of our learning outcomes and uh, our program learning outcomes and compare it with the narrative of the inner development goals. And we saw a lot of alignment. So actually, it's not that we had to change anything in what we had. It was just to explore what we have with the lenses of the inner development goals. And it was a, a really nice experience to see, well, actually, we're doing much more event than we thought. Or... Uh, how to frame or translate this. Sometimes the learning, especially program learning outcomes can be so abstract. How do you translate these in qualities and the skills that are so comprehensible for the student? And I think the inner development goals uh, gave us this, uh, this framework. And actually, if you look at it, it's nothing new because a lot of these qualities and these skills are in the 21st century skills frameworks that you, uh, you know mm-hmm. universities were using all over the world. Or, or these other competences for sustainability, but it is the language. It's so easy to understand. It's not, we're not talking about normative and strategic competency anymore, which is difficult for the, to understand for the student and for the teacher. Um, we're talking about, yeah, connectedness, so inner compass. And this is another narrative and another language that is also quite inspiring when you are educating um, students in the in the field of sustainability or sustainable development. And that is the process we did, just um, aligned it with the narrative and then take our students in the, in the journey. So we told the students, okay, these are the inner development goals. Our students have been working with SDGs and previous generation of our students with the Millennium Development Goals. So they are not estranged to the agenda, uh, but now it's like, okay, these are the tools that we can use and the capacities. I, I like to see the, the Inner Development Goals framework talks about qualities and the skills. And I, I like to use the word capabilities because I think they are more capabilities. And uh, and now I can tell my students, okay, so these are the capabilities that you need to develop and explore further if we want to get there. You know, I always... I think probably this will be the title of my uh, PhD thesis when I finish, but there's no transition without transformation. Mm. And the agenda is a transition document. And I think the inner development goals is a transformation path um, in order to get there, but then get there and don't make mistakes again. Mm. So that is a little bit the process we are in now. I think we are using the same tagline for Amsterdam. for the <laughs> Yeah. The, um, we call them because now you were able to translate the IDGs from English to Dutch. So we made the translation with a group of people and we call them vaardigheden and kwaliteiten. 
Mm-hmm. Not just skills, but vaardigheden and kwaliteit. So, because not all of them are really skills, like you just sent. Uh, yeah. Uh, capabilities. Yeah. So, um, I'm also I'm I'm just because you just mentioned of changing the world for these with these students, and I'm I I just mentioned Maria uh, Grazia Testa to you, and she has in the uh, LinkedIn header she has the saying the quote We don't need a better world. We need to be better for our world, and I think. That is a good point. Um, it, because I always see it also in comments on LinkedIn when there's a discussion going on that we cannot change the world, right? We cannot change the environment um, in a positive way because the nature will just do what it will do. And and th- I think that is true. And that's why also the IDGs are so important. We need to change ourselves, right? We need to change how true. we do it, how we respond to things and how true, we... True, true. I think it's so interesting, it's Anna, but it's also depending if, if we understand the, the world as the planet Earth with a natural ecosystem, of course. Uh, but I understand also the world is a construction that we do every day. And I think we can change it because we constructed that reality with the worldviews and mental models, right, that we have and we can construct new ones. So, of course, everything starts from inside. And I think... Uh, we need to to rethink our. Uh, this is a lot of Otto Scharmer <laughs> theory. You our uh, op- mm, our hard system, hardware. Uh, what are we thinking from? And and I think that uh, the framework could allow us to do this transformation inside. That by changing ourselves, we can change the world as the structural world that surround us. Right. They they and in that case. Yes, I think we need to construct a better world because the world we have constructed eh, and I, I, I was structure, social structure, economic structures, etc., is is fundamentally not working, um, and it's not sustainable long term. Long time. I mean, it can work for us for a few more years, eh, and we can all uh, be putting value on money instead of in nature and other so many things. But I think we deserve, actually. It's not only that we need it. I think we deserve a, a better world a structure and the pla- and also a world that serves the planet mm. in that sense. So sometimes it's difficult because we understand the world as the ecosystem and the world, but I try to, to, to separate it because sometimes the world has been so anthropocene. It has been something we constructed as humans. Yeah. Um, and... Uh, and I think we can we can do much better, but I totally agree that it starts the journey it starts inside, no question. Yeah. Yeah, and I was I was thinking about this this um, discussing with this a friend who's an entrepreneur, and when you talk about the um, what was it? Ooh, I forgot the theory that's behind this, but they talk about different colors that we use in language, right? So you have like the orange language, which is more like um, business, uh, corporations. They talk about wars, about competitors, about losing and winning. And then you have the green language. And they talk more about doing things together, um, making a better place together. Um, and the thing is, when we talk about that, the inner development starts, you know, the development starts, the change starts within ourselves. These these orange people don't understand us. They they have no clue because th- they haven't evolved at that point. And I'm not saying they are worse, but they have no clue what we are talking. They don't hear that language, like a child. When you say a child something, which is you know, which as an adult you understand, but a child doesn't understand. That's a, that's the same thing, right? So, um, for me, that's always a question: um, How do you bring the people along who don't yet understand mm. the language? Well, I wish I had the answer. Well, how do you do with that, students? Um, I think, well, first of all, with language, it's also what happens also with, with all the languages of the world, right? I mean, uh, uh, language is a cultural manifestation of, of the way we have constructed our own world. So depending also the language you speak, uh, you have a tendency to to understand the world and create the world around you um, in one of the other way. I always say like the Dutch, for example, is such an effective and efficient language <laughs> with a simple, but yet more really difficult grammar that you just learn as you, and 
but that is your reality and your and the representation of your own. Well, for example, me being a Spanish is quite descriptive and and language all over the place. So the same happens, like you say, with uh, with our understanding of inner development, etc. I think it's just like uh, what I try to to show my students at least is the disconnection that we have these uh, huge divides. Um, not only with nature um, and not only with economy, etc. We have a huge divide with ourselves. Uh, we have understood spirituality as religion. And if you choose not to be religious, then it means that you almost not look inside. And in this kind of uh, humanity-centered society, uh, we went all cognitive, and only put value up in our heads. And I think at a certain moment, we have to understand that um, uh, rationality is is great and we need it, uh, and cognitive thinking is great and we need it, but we have as human much more capacities to sense and understand the things around us. Now we're discussing scientifically about the third brain, the gut feeling the gut feeling that it used to be something, you know, like esoteric and intuition. And now if you think about how many big entrepreneurs have taken the biggest, more successful decisions of their lives, not with the brain, no cognitive, but because they had a gut feeling. And now we're discovering, oh, wait a minute. It seems that we have a lot of uh, nerves connections there. That So th- we are so holistic as humans. And that means also... Uh, uh, we have to reconnect inside before we start reconnecting, you know, with each other and with nature and with the planet, because otherwise it's not going to work. We we're going to keep looking at the at this world from a fragmented view and speaking different languages. But I think it's about recognizing the potential, incredible potential we have as humans. We know almost nothing about ourselves. And this is really nice, right? That we're trying to explore all the planets and go to Mars. Uh, and yet we know what, I don't know, only 50% of our brain works, of our body connects. And uh, we're discussing for generations eh, about the soul. Do we have a soul? What does a soul mean? Um, maybe in the soul is that connection that we lost as well with uh, with nature because we are part of an ecosystem and, and we are all connected uh, somehow. So I think that um, speaking the same language goes through getting to know the, the in this case, I'm going more Anthropocene, okay? If we we want to be so Anthropocene and human focus, let's really put the, um, the four to get to know us and how do we work completely and holistically and reconnect with each other again. And then other connections will be much, much more easy. There's two things I, I have from this, um, what you just all said. Um, one is Kahneman. I will, I will come back to him later. Um, the second is um, the when, whenever I talk about the IDGs, like you just mentioned, the, the, the language is so easy, right? The words are very easy to understand. Right. Whenever I talk about IDGs with people, um, especially compared to SDGs, right? So SDGs, it's huge. It's not clear what it exactly is. People put labels on the IDG labels on things that they do are already doing. So it's not really an effort. It's going to be a lot more difficult to put an SDG logo on something that you are not doing yet. And it costs mm-hmm. you money to do. That's going to be, lo- yeah, that's the tougher decision that I think more um, organizations, companies, and corporates sh- should make. Um, but whenever I talk about the IDGs and just explain a little bit of what it is, they, you know, they understand quickly they really it really clicks right away so I, I i agree the language is just it's a really it's a really good marketing they've come up with but it's it's easy to understand there's only 23 goals it's still 23 but so five domains um five yeah. to four uh, um skills in each domain so it's it and and you can just work on one skill if you you know where to start just begin with one skill and develop that one and then you know see how that works for you and how how your life changes when you do this that's how i you know how i see it and um 
when you talk about the gut, because I've been talking about the gut before in my um, writings when I talk about decision making, and um, I've been reading um, Kahneman's work and uh, Daniel Kahneman, who's all about you know the true system one and system two in the brain. Um, so very cognitive, of course. Um, but secondly, um, what he says, I also see is gut decisions sound very interesting, but there's also a lot of gut decisions that you made that didn't turn out right. You only remember one, the ones that did turn out right. That, you know, that's, oh yeah, no, that was a gut decision. Now it's right. So, or for example, but I often hear when they, you know, have, make an agreement with somebody and they're going to start to work together. And then when it, it fails, they afterwards say, yeah, my gut already told me something, but I didn't react. And I go like, okay, why not? Because you already hear the gut and why didn't you respond? So I, what I always say, if you make a decision, write it down, um, you know, write your process down to make a system of decision making. Even if, you know, even when the gut plays a role, write down what you felt at that moment. So when you look back after like two months or a half a year and you look back and you re-evaluate the decision process, not the result, because that's, you have no, you have no influence on result, but you have influence on your process. So look if your process is correct, yes or no, and then see how you can improve your decision-making process if you want to use the gut more or if you more often failed in your gut decisions because true but and and of course eh, we always make decisions um sometimes based on intuition that go wrong but we also make a lot of decisions all the time cognitive that go wrong exactly uh, so i i agree that we have to explore more how do we um uh, follow uh, uh, decision making at all levels, professional, uh, personal. Sometimes I think we have much more information that we think. And the problem is that, that we do not look at it. We don't listen and try to learn. Um, I, I had trainings uh, in the past about discovering your intuition. And now I know uh, to differentiate when there is intuition or when it's fear or because sometimes you, you have a tendency to feel as similar. And this also has to do with, um, I see an incredible disconnection, and going back to our conversation about language, about how we go on emotions. You know, we we have a tendency not to, I always say, for example, little kids, when they come to us, if when we're parents and the kids come and they are like, oh, because I'm upset and this and that. And at the end, what happens is that the kid is hungry or is tired. So we do not have this conversation of what are you really feeling? You know, what is really the pain? Is is, is that an emotion? Um, so I always um, remember to when my daughter, now she doesn't follow anymore my orders because she's 18. But when my daughter was a little bit younger and I was <laughs> starting to train in theory you. I would tell her, show me with your body, you know, this this is stuck a statue exercise. Don't tell me with words or what pain or what you're feeling, but show me with your body. Put the position so I can feel um, and I can read another part of your narrative uh, and see, is this an emotion? Is this, you know, like you're just tired or hungry, hungry or something like that? And is this this connection with our feelings and with our insight? that is making us not to know all of our, our potential. So actually uh, the inner development goals or any other inner development uh, with any other framework that can work for someone else uh, is not only bringing the possibility to uh, change, you know, things for a better world structure in this case. So it's actually bringing us so much potential personal and professional that we, we can explore. And I think this is where, for those say eh, in this language of oh yeah, but uh, more cognitive, is like well, I'm offering you even more. You know, I'm offering you to speak another language, which we all agree that speaking more than one language is so enriching. Yeah, then I'm also giving you the possibility to humanly uh, use so many different parts of of your body. But yes, true, we have to explore it, and we never put attention. When it's about intuition, it's just like something we forget. And when we take decisions with a lot of paperwork and research, it's something we have much more um, 
uh, able to monitor and evaluate. But I think there's even some initiatives in the research academia world to go back to intuitive research mm. because they have seen a lot of big discoveries of people that is a Nobel Prize, of course, came because they had a lot of knowledge and they had a lot of, but, but that moment, that exact moment of the big change did not came from the head. You know, it came from a sensing, a feeling, a, and you only can have that if you have work also this connection with the inside where yeah. you can put alignment. And I, I think that's uh, because I remember an interview with Kahneman it's because they talked about at some point, did he, obviously somebody said, so Kahneman doesn't believe in gut feelings and uh, gut decision making. And um, and one interview asked him, if, is this really true? And he says, no, it isn't true. I haven't ever said that. Um, but what is true that if you don't have experience on something or don't have knowledge on something and you make gut decisions, the chances are that they are not the right decisions because you have you have nothing there, right? So it's just, that's it, probably it's just fear, right? That's emotions that are responding. But if you have done same thing a lot of times and there is instant feedback, so you can see when you, when you decide something and you can see what the result is, so you get instant feedback of the outcome of your decision, then your gut will learn, your system will learn, and then decision making sure. and you gut is easy. And I think that's a similar thing, right? If you may have like an observation or an, you know, an, an insightful idea um, that isn't, if I made the decision, made the sign with my head, but it isn't really there. It's just maybe here in my heart, right? Yeah. Um, then it was based on everything you did before that and all the responses you got from the, all the experiences or experiments you did at a time. So I think uh, it is true. Um, but a lot of people talk about like, you know, how do you hire people in your company? And they said, well, it's more like a gut feeling. Whenever I meet somebody, it's like in two, three seconds, I know I, I, I can't agree with that part of decision making because then you will just attract the same people that you like and know and people like you. And you just like did in your life, maybe like 50 interviews and you hired maybe 10 that's not a really good foundation to make gut decisions on that two seconds with the first per person you meet, right? So, but that's how the society is constructed, right? Like this is the the myth of Hollywood first a love at first sight. <laughs> yeah, it's a myth. It's a myth. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Totally agree, but yeah, I think we need to go back to um, to another way again of constructing our world and our scientific uh, um, way of looking at things, right? I think most of the European um, science that has dominated Western science um, is fragmentalized and is rationality. And there's so many other things out there. And uh, and it's okay to integrate them. It, it, we are not saying, okay, um, thinking with the head and rationality is, uh, is the only thing. Um, I mean, it's bad. And the other thing is good. It's just we need more holistic and more integration. And I think we need to open our wisdom to other kind of wisdoms you know like now we talk about indigenous wisdom yeah there's so many voices there that we have to listen as well and we have to take this narrative aside for so many years of western domination of the narrative affecting you know politics policy decision making and maybe it's nice that we listen to other voices that have as much wisdom and are better than us in aligning the the heart uh, uh the head and the stomach you know the yeah. gut yeah. yeah yeah i i was reading um and i'm reading an, again a new book uh, by david graber the the dutch translation is just out about um something about pirates uh pirates uh the insole the the island at uh, below uh, madagascar mm -hmm. and um they apparently it's not sure, but apparently there was a, a time in history, I think it was like the 17th century or, yeah, I think it was 17th century. There was a time on this island um, where there was like a um, pirate democracy. So um, everybody does their own thing until um, you go to battle, until something is happening. Then there is suddenly um, a strict order of how things are happening, like on a pirate ship. 
when we go to battle, the captain decides how we do things, right? So then there's the order in ranks with all the people. If not, it's just it's just chaos. Everybody's doing their things and it doesn't really matter what rank you are. And the same thing they tried on this island. And the whole story about the verlichting, I'm not sure what again mm-hmm. the English translation is. Yeah. Enlightenment, exactly. And um that probably could have just might as well just came through all the ships that went past Madagascar to Europe <clears throat> and where this so-called Western idea of enlightenment is nothing Western at all. Because also in the other book, um what is the title again? Um I think it's like whole the start of everything, I think it is. I'm not sure what the English title is, but it's also a great book. Um, where he talks about the indigenous people, because he's mentioned indigenous um, uh, ideas, and the indigenous people, actually, we learned from them, right? So according to them, we had like a really weird society where we need like judges and stuff like that. And we thought it was like the level up when you have judges, they can, they can decide of how the order yeah. should be. And they mm-hmm. said, well, you don't, we don't need that. We we are just leveled up from you. We have, there's no need for us because we don't have a war. We don't have people who need to defend, defend their country or their land because we have, we don't have these discussions. And then, you know, enlightenment probably comes from indigenous people instead of from us as the Western people. Right. So that was um, for me, yeah. really an opening. I think we have to revise our history, right? I think yeah. we are now entering in this kind of a, uh... A revisionism of of history, and I have a lot of students, a lot of students in the last year, so interested in decolonization of language, decolonization of the of the human rights declaration, eh? because it's also it's still Western, and from a Western perspective, we have to decolonize education, um, and I think it's a good exercise because you know I am from Spain, so Spain was one of the biggest colonizers. And I have learned history uh, from a totally different perspective than when I talk to my friends from South America. And now that I'm also hearing their perspectives and how uh, their experience have been shaped uh, because of colonization, etc. I am, it's okay to be also uh, feel ashamed sometimes of our past and recognize that we didn't do things right at all and also to recognize that our privilege and our status in society it is thanks to that colonizing and slavery and uh, having access for so many years to resources for free and this is also something we need to take into consideration in 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 the in the narrative of sustainability Mm. it is so easy from a global north perspective to tell the south what to do in sustainable development um, when actually we have been, you know, making their countries uh, running in the second league because we we abuse them and we abuse their environments, etc. So I think this is also uh, going back to to the inner development goals that when you align with yourself and this inner development journey. You also have to be prepared, and one one of the qualities is courage, um, to confront your worldviews, to um, self-reflect and contrast uh, your own status quo. And I think this is probably the most challenging part of the inner development, right? To, To have the courage to understand, okay, I think this way for so many other reasons, for so many layers in the onion through generations of history, culture, language, etc. Um, but there's also other ways that are possible. And as you know, now they are uh, in the Inner Development Goals is a second round of research, um, opening the framework uh, and the research uh, to uh, people from other cultures and the Global South, because maybe we understand qualities differently. It's not maybe that's for sure, <laughs> and, and maybe we need it. Eh, we we are at different speeds. Uh, uh, maybe they have more courage than we have because they have less to lose, in that sense. Um, so it's I think inner development is is a door. Um, I think if you go to through this inner development journey with yourself and you're able to challenge your own status quo, is the door for a more open society where we can live with pir- like pirates. Mm. Like then we don't need rules because 
we we will respect each other. We will understand that our freedom stops when the freedom of the other one starts. I remember Chomsky, someone asked him in an interview, how can you be an anarchist? You know, anarchist is chaos. And he said, I'm an intellectual anarchist. And the problem is anarchist is the, so he said, anarchism is the most civilized form of organization in a society. But the problem is to have that, we all have to be highly educated, um, grow innerly to understand that we have to respect each other. But uh, yeah, I think we're far away from the model of society at this moment. Well, I think we are working at it right now. We're working at it. We're working at it. We're in the process. I have a uh, awkward question. Um, and I've I've looked through your resume and so on, and I you know, I see that you you're just mentioned it. You have this honors um, program that you do. What is an honors program? I have no idea. This is also an interesting question. We are in the in the Netherlands. You have uh, the honors program, so this is something that universities and uh, HBOs offer students that want an extra mile that want to do something extra and then they will take like extra lessons usually um, most of the time in relation to sustainable development especially in the last years so it's an extra program with extra credits next to whatever they are doing but we are a honors bachelor so that means that um the whole bachelor, the, our whole program is thought from the perspective of honors education. And that means an education that is intensive, uh, mostly a small scale, um, but also uh, goes beyond the discipline. So we set our students eh, also in inner growth, in personal development, in understanding also their role, not as professional, but their role as social agents. Eh? You also... Mm, are a person in this world that have certain uh, responsibilities with society. And uh, we provide a lot of high doses of critical thinking. I think for for our students, this is relevant. I always say for us, questions are more important. Good questions are more important than good answers. Uh, And our whole educational system has been focusing answers, check, 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 exams. And I always say that uh, Otto Scharmer said eh, when when they they asked him about the future of university, he's like, oh, university should be the place where you come with good questions and you live with more and better questions. <laughs> so for four years, you don't do anything. You don't look for answers only for good, good questions. And I think that is the essence of honors education, to, to, to work with the students that um, want to challenge their status quo of themselves, their own learning, and therefore of their profession, of their society. And that's how the setting uh, works. Yeah. Okay, so a couple of questions that come to my head now is, so how is it possible to do this? Because I, I assume that the students have like the same <clears throat> um, access to the education as the other students. They don't, they don't, have like private money and they need to invest in this um, study and um, they just use the same study funds that everybody else has. So um, if that is true and you have like small groups of people that you teach, how is this possible in the existing system? Why isn't everybody doing the same thing if that is, if it is possible? Well, it is possible. Uh, I always say there's nothing impossible, right? In the word impossible, if you put it in fragments, is I am possible. Uh, I think probably is that um, to change university is really difficult because it has become a monster of bureaucracy. And we have become also a factory of feeding the market with uh, whatever titles or jobs that are needed is our focus is employability most of the time, not really learning or creating a, a better fit in the society instead of the market. Um, I think because it's intensive, then you have to, we select the students in our program. We only take 80 students per year. So there's a selection procedure, motivation letter. We get to know them. They have to come to us. Uh, We do a lot of work before they formalize the application and they are in. 
Uh, just in mind if you have to do this for all the programs, uh, you need to invest more money and to make possible that the lessons are not lessons of 300 people or 200 people. You know, you have to, you cannot do work with the students. Uh, and I'm from that university. I study in the in my university, um, I study Madrid in the University of Complutense, one of the biggest ones in the country. And sometimes I went to lectures of 300 people. And I was happy because my lecture, my lecturer was Manuel Castells, you know, and I was like, oh my God, I'm having a lecture of Manuel Castell, so I have to be happy. But, you know, I have to, there was not an interaction in the lectures, right? It was like going to, I don't know, to a theater to, to see a movie. And I think if you aim for other type of education where is um uh, more interaction with the students, uh, we always say that one of our characteristics is we create a community of learning. I don't, I learn from my students. I'm not just teaching, I'm learning from them as well. You have to do a little bit more small scale. And uh, maybe we also have to rethink, is everyone ready to go to university? You know, we also have to to go away from this status thing that only people that goes to university is the most intelligent and successful ever. And no, uh, and maybe we have to see who who wants to play in this in this kind of league, and what are we gonna do here, and who is more useful and uh, is gonna be more successful doing something else that uh, that university. And in that sense, maybe when we start to have that realization that all kind of education is great, we just have different areas, uh, we can have much more small scale um, uh, settings. I don't know what the what the answer is, to be honest, but I, I do know that it works and, and it's possible. Mm. Sometimes it's just like a matter of, of willing and trying other forms. It sounds a bit like, uh, what's it called? Chaos Pilots? Yeah, no Chaos Pilot. Yeah, I think a lot of, or, or no Maths Academy. <laughs> I think a lot of our colleagues inside of education has exit education. And they start these things outside when for them it was not possible inside. We have managed to do it inside. And I have to say, it has not been an easy ride either. Uh, we were the first uh, fully honors bachelor. We were the first kind of university college setting in a HBO, because university college is, is a concept reserved for research universities in the Netherlands. International in a quite original, big, but regional university. And we have seen as elite, uh, as hippies, <laughs> at, as weird, everything. But yet, you know, here we are, and our students, uh, we have a, now a huge community of alumni working in so many different settings and successfully, and coming back home, you know? And, and I think that's for us also, a way to measure our success. We have alumni that are happy to come back home, to see us once in a while, to interact with the new students. They are not like, oh my God, I'm just done with the study and I don't see these people anymore. Um, so it's like good parenting, right? When your kids still come home, is that we have done something good. And I think uh, there's more, much more initiatives. Eh? We started a little bit unique some years ago, but there's you see a change. You see a lot of things going on in education. And I think universities have to understand that new forms are possible and that we have to have the courage again, is my one of my favorite <laughs> in the development goals, to dare to, to imagine and create a new form. Um, and you have to create the spaces for our students to be able to imagine new scenarios. We we have to stop with this education of giving, just feeding them all the time. Yeah, yeah. You know, we have to create spaces for experimentation and imagination, and that requires a smaller scale and intensive, like a lot of attention. So we have to to value this ratio. You cannot ask a teacher. I cannot also. I'm so lucky to to work here because you know I have a small groups, but I was like, if I will be being a teacher to 200 students that I don't even know the names, 
what is the value there? Mm. Mm. So we have to rethink this. Um, I think it's important to engage with people you were talking about uh, before the, the podcast, the pre-podcast conversation about connectedness. And it's the only way we learn, right? I mean, it's when we really connect with people in a conversation, when we engage, they say, oh, wow. So how can we connect with our students otherwise that creating a, a more, you know, community of learning environment where we can trust each other? Yeah, I agree. I remember, <clears throat> and I talk about her a lot, even if I don't know her and I haven't um, been to any of her lectures or workshops or anything, but a friend of mine talks about her a lot, um, Nora Bateson. And she lives in Sweden too, I believe, or Norway, I'm not sure. I think it's Sweden. And she talks about warm data, right? So the warm data that's um, um, created in a dialogue between people. So that's, we don't learn from books. We don't learn from, um, you know, reading stuff. We learn from dialogue. We learn from having conversations with other people because that's the moment where you get feedback from what you're saying yeah. and you get challenged with your ideas and you have to reword your ideas so that other people understand them. So that's the moments what you really learn. And I, I, I talk a lot about this because um, a dialogue is, yeah, that's, I think, and I'm, I'm not saying that I'm good at it because it just had a conversation with somebody and I learned that I, I didn't do a good dialogue there. Um, but it, I think it is the solution. Like you just mentioned, if, if you have, a university, an honors program where it's about asking better questions, asking questions from your teacher. The teacher is asking you a question. Then there is a dialogue. Then you will learn because it's not just about um, learning stuff from the books and you know have like a test and making sure you, you put down yeah. the right answers. But no, it's about you know reading the book and talking to other people about it and then hearing their version of the same context and you know they have a different background because they've grown up somewhere else and they read the same story in a different way they pick up different items from the same stories and when you have a conversation you can also learn you know how 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 can I how can they see it differently how can they not exactly. see my point of view right so how, yeah. and then you know then you have a conversation you learn so much more so the students have to be really um, willing to do this, and and I've had this now a couple of times um, when I talked uh, when I was in the, in the parent board at the school of my children, and they introduced a new way of um, a new track of learning at the FVO, and um, I I wish. I was going to school at that time, right? Yeah. And now I have the same feeling here when when you talk to me about what you're doing in your tracks and your education. I have uh, that feeling every day with my students. I, I, I can imagine how lucky you are. <laughs> exactly. I I I, I, I can imagine the same form thing. Of yeah. 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 So we should move and do this a lot more. Of course, um yeah. oh, probably not. I'm just going to ask you this one to see uh, what you think. So then, of course, there's a lot of people who are not, you know, um, into, they they won't never make it to university um, because of you know, their IQ or the way of they learn of whatever. And um, so they are more like, they usually go to practical schools and like learn a trade or learn a skill and just do practical work with their hands. Um, And my daughter, she went to the um, to uh, to become a nurse um, at the HBO still, but still um, practical. So she learned a lot practices of you know bringing syringes or whatever um, things I would never do. <laughs> <laughs> How and that's I'm 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 thinking about a question. I'm also thinking about what I'm thinking about this right now. So it's you're, difficult. You're meta thinking now. Yes, this meta is thinking. this is really <laughs> awkward because I'm thinking. So how could you arrange the same thing in this practical environment? Um, more hands on. 
Yeah, what do you think? How could you? Well, first of all, I, 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 going back to to the first part of your question, this is something we also need to change, right? Because we have organized this society education based in the access of the IQ, and the IQ is changing. We need to understand this. Um, there's a lot of research being done how social media and uh, technology is in, interacting in a lot of parts of how we measure IQ until now, right? Like in probably, uh, I'm 53, I don't, I don't know how old you are, but if people of my generation, uh, we used to, sometimes I tell my daughter and she laughs and my students, we used to go on holiday with a big map in the car, right? <laughs> Remember? Um uh, it seems that uh, people from our generation scores much better in um, in room, um, a space uh, dimension um, perception that this generation, yet this is something measured in IQ levels, right? So when they have, they are doing these tests now, uh, I think they started in, in Norway where Norwegian kids are have less IQ than their parents. Well, if we measure with the same standards, yes. But maybe in other things, they score much better. And then intelligence is measured. And now we know, and we discussed about this a moment ago, is spiritual intelligence, emotional intelligence. So there's much more. So we have to rethink the way that we are now in this kind of hierarchical way that only IQ intelligent people make it to university. No, 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 no. There's Italian people everywhere. The only thing their talent is expressed differently. Some people like the thinking, cognitive, reading, writing. Other people need to do things with the hands and they are really good. So that is something that, that I think should change. And then these spaces are possible at all levels because what these spaces are is first connect with your students, get to know them. You have people there that is not in a student number. I know my students. Uh, I know sometimes things about their lives. We have an incredible close career counseling support. Um, they feel so open to to talk about us, about their daily lives. Um, and next to that, uh, provide an environment where you also put the student uh, in the driver's seat. Learning is their responsibility. Learning happens there. You know, it's like uh, funny. Sometimes I have a student that said, oh, I have to do all the learning myself. Duh, yes, I can do it for you. What I can do is prepare soil, you know, give you the soil where you will grow things. And I'm so interesting personally, and that is also the characteristic of our program in transformative learning. You know, we have... Uh, we can do project based and, and we can teach certain skills, et cetera, et cetera. But this transformative learning, we cannot control anymore. We are, we are gardeners, right? We only can provide the soil that eventually, and we all had that, that after a few years uh, and the student is already working, already graduated, and they call you, oh my God, now I understand what you told me in year one in this. Yeah, and maybe they didn't pass the exam, but they did learn because when given the opportunity, this came up. So I think it's just to, to rethink the way we think about education, you know, to first, everyone is intelligent. Everyone is doing incredible things. Maybe uh, we didn't, we didn't, um, we shouldn't have this distribution of, well, this is also so in the Netherlands, I have a research university MBO. Maybe it's like, you know, adult, education eh, or adulthood education where students can be working in one thing from different perspective and and uh, where we create this kind of learning communities where we as teacher continue continue learning and also from each other not in silos so i do think it's possible but it does require to rethink the whole system again and that is scary it's also because I'm thinking about the consequences after school, because it's also a great opportunity to bring back um, more equality in life afterwards. Because if you if you think about it just the way you described, 
um, it will be less based, like you get paid as a university more as who is somebody who's like an MBO, right? So that's that's how it is now. But if we just get rid of the whole idea, and of course, um, adults like you and me, and we have, you know, have this education, we have happy or, or university, we say, no, that's a really important uh, constitute. We need to keep that because that's, you know, it's uh, important that we have the right people in the top making the right decision. But the decisions in the top and right now, because in the um, Easter Kama, Twitter Kama, it is mostly university educated people, right? So mostly like I think it is 95% or something like that. So you don't get any opinions from people who are um, MBO, right? Who are practical, for example, within governmental areas. They have lost completely touch with people who work in that area. Yeah. And um, of course, these same people will say, no, we are, we know, we make the best decision and look at the mess they are making. So they are not making the best decision. I'm not saying the other ones are making better decisions. They probably make the They're same worst decision. They're not given the opportunity. But it's it is and it is it is like a difficult word. Of course, we make mis mistakes. Of course, but if we don't listen to other people from other silos or yeah. other backgrounds or other, and this is so interesting, right? Because it's again the hierarchical. This is social stratification. Uh, that thinking that in the top of the pyramid, if you're here, you can do better. I don't know personally. Uh, if I think money and financially. My friends that did not go to university and start doing their own business because they were more entrepreneurial are making more money than me, that I went to university and doing my PhD. So it's a myth. It's a myth. In Spain, it's funny because sometimes I have seen jokes about this because a lot of people, we were a generation, my generation was like, please go to university. And university was so accessible for everyone because it was really cheap. Uh, so our parents were like, oh, my God, all the kids to university. Suddenly we don't have. Eh? It was a generation that we didn't have any more electricians and good. So when one of them was good, they were making so much money that sometimes, you know, in Spain, um, if you're a lawyer and you have a private consultation, you put this gold kind of uh, plate, you know, in, in, in your house. And then there were like a bigger plate for whatever, whatever, a lot hitter or electrician because they were making more money. And this is probably what is going to come to the Netherlands, right? Because we're lacking these people. We put so much pressure in our kids to go to university because it's like if you don't go to university, you're no one. And I'm the first one that, that do that with my own daughter. I have to say, oh, please go to university. That we are not... Um, embracing and the talent of these other uh, uh, levels who are sustaining our society. And then with the decision making, I totally agree. Because yesterday, actually, I was watching a program where the architect, you know, these programs where they design a spectacular houses, and the architect did all these things. But when the day of putting everything together, because it was like a prefab, it did not work because they never talked to the electrician guy and to the other guy and they say, yeah, but this is impossible. You know, no, no, because your house will burn. So this is the disconnection and the fragmentation, right? That we don't talk to each other in these levels, in discipline level. We have the example with COVID, you know, everyone was in epistemology, <laughs> epidemiology at the same time, but no one knew anything. Uh, we didn't talk to each other. So we need to go to a more holistic understanding of education and mm -hmm. and to understand again that um, intelligence is going to change. You know, uh, the way we look at, we have artificial intelligence kicking in. We have the GDP chat discussion now in education. We have MIT working. I think they are about to present it, right? This chip uh, that you can put in your brains and you have access to all the knowledge of the world. So what do, how do we measure that? Yeah. We have to come up with uh, different ways and, and different systems. And and I think also what people is good in, you know? So, and I have as a parent, not, not only as an educator, so many times I also ask myself, do I take good choices for my kid? Because maybe, I don't know, she wanted to be a hairdresser and that was her passion and she would have been successful and happy and the best her dresser of the world, why should she be, I don't know, a doctor and be miserable? Yeah, I agree. And I have 
I can I can only look back at my own life, right? So I have done an MBA, MBO, um, uh, electrician. I, I'm 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 I've learned you know to do electrician's work, um, and also electronics. Um, so I did two on the MBO. Then I went to the Habio to telecommunication again, practical, but you know more on computers at that time, and then I did an MBA because I felt it was important to understand like what's going on with strategy, what's going on internally, culture and all this stuff. I, f- I found it really interesting in companies, how it worked. And I want to learn more about it. And I've, I, f- I think I'm, I'm even learning more today than I ever did before um, by talking to people, reading books. I'm reading so many books now and then, and then, you know, writing about it and then discussing it with another friend. We do this book podcast um, every two weeks when we discuss a book. Um, so because then we talk about, we have different point of views on the same book, or I talk with people in the podcast like you. And um, and I see um, my daughter choose to um, go from the MBO to the, um, from the half or to the HBO. And she wanted to become a nurse at some point. And I always thought she was going to be like um, somebody on stage, right? In a theater, because she was very expressive when she was younger. And and I was fine with I you know that was fine with me and she didn't have to go but then found, she thought okay I'm gonna be a, a nurse I want to work in a very um, stressful environment um, like the Esther Hope right so um, uh, ER or you know to, a lot of stress and I like when s- stuff is going on and um, and our son um, he was at Fibio, so he was he could learn easier, faster. My daughter had to put like a lot of effort in, in studying, but he was just it just worked for him. So when he finished the Fibio, um in in one go, which most of the people just were amazed because he wasn't doing so well just before that, but he made it, and it's just my son. And um <laughs> then he went to the Habio and I go like, why do you want to go to the Habio now? He says, well it's more practical. Now I don't have to do all this thinking anymore. I can just do stuff with my hands and it's more practical than the university. He said, yo, <laughs> I have done the, the ABIO. You're wrong. It's, just, it's, it's all books. It's, there's not a lot of practical stuff going on. It's just some classes. The rest is just all books. But, you know, it's your decision. You go to ABIO. So he did one year. Then he, you know, he all the classes were really easy for him. Um, only only the project he failed because the other people all fell off and he just you couldn't finish the project, so he didn't have his um, what's it called the um, preparation, okay. and so then he went to the university. So he lost lost a year, of course not, but um, it just cost him extra money. But that's he didn't lose a year, and um, he went to economics, which I, I um, again didn't understand. <laughs> Why you want to do that? <laughs> anyway, because it's just books. It's just reading all books. It's nothing going on on practical side anymore at all. And now he's evaluating um, um, finances, uh, um, loans for companies. Um, that's his first job at the Rabobank. So, um, and I'm telling you this because what happens now, obviously, is you can see the difference on level of pay. Right? He's a man, university starts he's already farther than my daughter who who had to study much harder to get where she is now she's already again studying in her new job um but he's he's going so much faster than she is and um you know i i don't blame him i don't say he's doing something wrong but the system is wrong that we allow this to happen right so the system is wrong that's why i think we should start with the education and change that because then the level will be so much different right yeah i had this conversation exactly this conversation this weekend with some friends um because every morning when i go to work i see the cleaning lady you know on the other day she was cleaning the the bathrooms and someone i don't know was sick probably and throw up in the sink and she was cleaning and then i enter in the toilet and it was a little bit disgusting and then she was cleaning and then i was thinking Wow, you know, this girl comes here probably really difficult hours because they probably start at six. Um, they have to clean all these. So it's a job that requires a lot of, you know, dealing with cleaning the hard work. Well, I was like, probably I'm making, I don't know, 
how much, much, much money than she's making by coming to a clean desk that she cleaned for me, getting a coffee, talk to students, learn, have meetings, sit down. Of course, I do probably an intellectual work, but what? Why is an intellectual work more than her work that also requires the capacity to deal with certain emotions and struggles? Or the nurse, uh, what you told about your daughter, like a nurse that is probably, you know, a cleaning sick people, caring for sick people who is not sometimes the most easy people in the world, uh, dealing with uh, hard decision situations where you affect the life of someone else towards the other one, probably in a nice uh, office in the rubber bank, you know. We have created this society that does not really value work as such. It values prestige, elite, and a title. And not really what, and we all know, you and me, through our experience of life, we have seen great managers and we have seen lousy managers and we have seen um, people with, with a PhD that is stupid or you think like, oh my God, okay, you probably know so much about the flower of whatever because you studied for years, but you don't know anything about society and people that did not never go through education and it's incredible wise. I always think like my grandpa, I always thought that he was one of the wisest men of the world. He was never in a school. You know, so I think we have to re yeah, rethink the system totally. Rethink the system of where do we want to really put the value? Uh, where do we want to learn from and um, to start listening and, and, and looking around us, you know, it's like connect to the people around us. And I, I I usually tell this a lot to my students, you know, when they drop something in the classroom or they leave a glass or but like, do you know there's a person cleaning your shit every single day that is probably not pay anything in comparison to what you guys eh, eventually will make, can we also be considerate? Can we also say hello when we come in the morning and see her? Because a lot of times these people is also eh, certain people in certain jobs are invisible, are invisible. And that I think is even a sign of how the disconnection again eh, of, of our society is terrible. Yes. It's terrible. Yes. Or the people that clean the streets, you know, these kind of things. Um, I, I tease my my daughter a lot because the other day it was someone uh, cleaning the street and uh, and then I, I tried to say hello and be nice. And then she was like, oh, one day you will invite them for coffee. And I was, oh, good idea. <laughs> oh, mama, <laughs> you invite for coffee before you don't know. And I was like, oh, it's not that, but these people are like there every day in our daily lives making our society be better for us and we don't put attention you know but if i don't know marute walks here in the street is like oh my god the prime minister everyone like, and marute is not making my life easier <laughs> you know he does <laughs> so i think this is something that we we have to rethink um uh society in mm. but it is a scary because you we will have to change so much our way of understanding things and organizing things that I can imagine for a lot of people holding in this power structure is uh, is itchy yeah. to think about this. Yeah. Yeah. I, I want to ask one more thing before we close. Um, you have the value creators <clears throat> and um, there you have the 4E model. Yeah. Explore, engage, elaborate, and evaluate. Can you tell us a bit more about why this is important to you? When we were designing this concept of education, eh, how to uh, put our students in complexity awareness, to, to work with complex questions, uh, we took a look at um, different models. Uh, how do we take them through this journey? So we, we incorporate a theory U, we, incorporate, we took a look at design thinking eh, structures, and we came up with this model because first explore is important because if we don't, if we're not able to see the system, why is this system complex? You know, if we cannot see the complexity of the system, we are still not thinking from the whole. We're missing the whole picture. So the explore is about, okay, whatever you want to do, 
uh, we always tell them, hey, you dance with the system, learn how to dance with the system because you cannot change it, but you can put some movements there where the dynamic will change. Um, so in this phrase, let's say the metaphor is that the student will be able to take a look at the complex of the system and like the, I always use the, the metaphor, the stone in the pond. Then I can decide, I cannot control the waves, but I can decide where in this lake I'm going to throw the stone and how my stone is going to look like because I have an overview of the whole. Engage because it's fundamental. You cannot address complexity solo. Again, you know, we cannot do this alone. Um, politicians cannot do this alone. We cannot do this alone in university. So this integration of who needs to be invited to dance with you because you cannot solve this alone. So take a look at what kind of stakeholders and we're trying to move away. I have a colleague, uh, Diana, as she always said, let's move away from stakeholders uh, to call them uh, actors, mm. but human and non-human actors. So start, you know, there's also non-human actors that can play a, a role in, in, in change. And then elaborate because without action, we don't move. So uh, we are the society that has much more access to information. We can all talk and discuss forever. But at a certain moment, it's like, okay, we're engaged to do something. So we have to elaborate. We have to, uh, okay, in this dance, what steps are we going to, what music are we going to play? Uh, and finally, also evaluate because uh, we, self reflection and going back, eh, how, oh, we were planning to create this value, did we? And sometimes we create value in other places that we were not aware of. So it's also good to have a moment of silence and, and observe what has happened and what has happened also internally. In this case, for value creators, it's a double reading because the evaluation is also self evaluation. Mm. So what has happened to me in this journey? Uh, what is different? And, and in this case, we also um, tell them to use the framework of the inner development goals to, to think about qualities and the skills that uh, grew or maybe were there already, but not so obvious or latent, uh, and maybe some new ones that they had to use and acquire. So the, the 40 model, I think it works so well because of the simplicity, yet, embeds design thinking and through you, et cetera. But it is so simple. It's these are steps where you need to, and you can constantly do them, right? I mean, after evaluation, you may want to explore again and again and again. Um, and our struggle for education is that in a normal situation, you will have this cir circular almost, right? But education is linear. Mm -hmm. This semester, this semester. So students sometimes also say, oh, by the time we're done, you know, we would like to maybe go back to exploring again. And and you cannot because it's linear and it's taken in through a process of deadlines. So that is something we would love to, to change and experiment outside of the constraints of education. But that is the essence of these four steps. Uh, that complexity, you have to look at it, you have to see the system and sense it, that you cannot do it alone, that you need to take action and that you also need to reflect on what can be better or what did work really well that we can repeat. So this is the model in a nutshell. Nice, nice. Yeah, self-reflection may be one of the most important things that we need to do more, yeah. right? Okay, Maria, um, it was so wonderful to talk to you finally. And um, I have... Still a lot more questions, but we're going to meet and talk about that on a later time. Um, and you listeners won't, you have to just, uh, you know, connect with Maria yourself and find out what she's all doing. Sure. Because, you know, IEGs and um, the honor program and the winter time and everything. It's really interesting. Um, I learned a lot today about um, the holistic view, about the educational system, about the honors program, why it's so different, why it's aside, why you want small groups, why um, learning to ask better questions is more important than learning the right answers. Um, we talked about the systems, about educational systems, and also then later on the effect in your working life and payment and equality and so on. And of course, 
at the foundation of all our discussions is the IDGs, um, you know, improve yourself and take others with you on your journey so that we can, you know, not change the construct of the world, to use your words. Um, so thank you for that, Maria. Thank you so much. I enjoy so much the conversation. I also learn a lot. And then we will do the pod podcast. <laughs> the pre-podcast, <laughs> we continue the conversation. Thank yeah. you so much. <laughs>